work that I'm working on at the moment. Just this is very recently being finished. Uh, this is a triptych, and this is uh, so I just open this up. This is um, more about looking at uh, different aspects of the book. If we look at the history of the book with diptychs, triptychs, and polytychs, this is a contemporary uh, sort of manifestation of that. Um, and again, we've got uh, a little bit of collage work happening down here, which is perhaps what I people may know my work is about a manipulated um, antique ish photograph of somebody i don't know who they are if it is re your relation do phone in um <laughs> some more down here as well this is part of my uh, buried book uh, sort of um ongoing thing where I, i'm sort of burying books uh, all the time and this just shows the beautiful sort of shapes contours and colors that come out of the ground and i really do I, I love what happens to the books and it's almost like an archae archaeological sort of experiment and again all these are sort of books that i make they are my sketchbooks they are not they're not anybody else's books by any stretch of the imagination i wouldn't do that and again you know you can see how you know things delaminate materials change but you know technically it is a book yeah the page is still open they still work but this is only in the ground for about a month so you can see that next time you're watching a hollywood movie and they say we've just un unearthed a 2000 year old book it ain't going to look anything at all like hollywood has it but again um you know it's about using different stuff and that sort of thing uh, about uh, you know, taking it forward and then you know buried books the perhaps the more experimental view of the book uh, sort of looking at it from the perspective of uh, reforming and reshaping something and this is buried and it's you know rigid in that shape now and again you know I suppose one could say you know from a rest restorers or conservators perspective they'd be going no but if you're suffering you know water damage <laughs> books and things like that well that's how it's done and of course all these books are frozen once I get them out of the ground yeah. Um, defumigated to kill any uh, microorganisms, etc., etc., etc. That was my question. How do we store them? Because they are, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so this is it. But it it is one of these things. You know how far, you know, you can go with things. And there is, I believe, a certain element of beauty of something else in there. And I, I really do like it. This one is yet to be cleaned. But we can still see the evidence of the uh, soil on there. Yeah. This is great. But then you. I was wondering what put you on this track because uh, all uh, this reminds me of Cuthbert, uh Bible, the Irish book they found in the bog, early medieval. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, this is one of the things. Books can be remarkably strong, depending on the environment. I mean, the for example, you know, it's um, so many books or parts of books are kept are being found are being unearthed that are hundreds if not centuries if not thousands of years old you know the dead sea scrolls is just one example and you know they are remarkable things and this is if you like this is a hark back to the the dead sea scrolls with perhaps within a contemporary context now for example this book here this is one that um, i finished working on a couple of years ago and this book was buried on the south island of new zealand and it went through two earthquakes and what i've done is i've made a little box for it so you can see it because you know i like it to go on exhibition and if we take the perspex cover off we can begin to see you know see it more in its in its light now you'll notice that there's a hole here here and part of the spine is missing here that's basically because the person who buried it buried it one of my students and then um, it was dug up by a farmer, by a farmer using a garden fork. And those are the three holes made by the made by the tines of the fork going in. I mean, what are the chances of that happening? We don't know, but we can see from it. And it's also you can see we've got gold leaf and things happening in there because there's a Japanese ceramics repair technique called Kintsugi, which basically a rough translation is uh, lacquered gold. And when they repair ceramics, they repair it using lacquer and gold leaf and gold powders and po uh, platinum powders to highlight the repair. So I thought I would do the same with all the 
knocks, bumps and lumps with this. And this is number two in the series. So we can open the book up. And so it opens. And we can begin to see the inside of it as well. And we can see where the gold leaf, you can actually physically see where those holes have gone through and punctured into the text block. And again, you can see that the gold leaf has been laid into those puncture marks. Again, highlighting it, but you know, it stands up. It is a book, it is recognizable very much as a book, but you know, in a, in a different format, in a different way that perhaps we're used to seeing. But again, you know, what is, you know, what is the book? You know, this is sort of perhaps harking back to a bygone age and you know the archaeology of things and again it's taking it back to perhaps its natural state so again this is where you know conservation cross fertilization from different other arts and crafts and other disciplines can be brought together in the one object which of course is the book so you know it's not about just you know leather raised bands bit of gold tooling there is a lot more to it as I perceive the book to be anyway and I suppose one could argue uh, it, the pages have been you know sealed together with various enzymes and everything else and you can see all that beautiful texture happening just there perhaps and arguably so it's not a book it's only got two parts to it but this part and this part well one could argue then that this is not a book and this is a facsimile of a Romano British diptych beeswax carved out wood panels and everything else now that to me is as much relevance and has as much meaning and as much depth as this and this this and that so there are the, the this is where i can see definite parallels definite crossovers and a definite continuation of the medium and in fact if we were to think of these three being together where we do have the scroll the diptych and the contemporary artist book then we can see that very definite continuation happening. So that's that's that bit. Should we look at some other books? That's a good question, by the way. What's what's the book? Once again, we're returning to it, and yeah. uh, we had discussions with Pavel that's as well because say. is it a book when when it's it's a collection of wax plates uh, uh, stitched together? I guess it is a book. Yes, of course it is. Yeah, I mean it's a three-dimensional articulated structure that has surfaces that are capable of either carrying having or being written into or transmitting information. That is exactly the same yeah. as one of my sketchbooks. It functions in the same way. Okay, this is a simplified, simplified version. One could argue that this diptych, this, sorry, this triptych here is another variation on that. For me, that is a book. It's articulated, it carries words, it carries imagery, it opens and it closes. That, for me, is a book it is as valid it is as relevant in fact probably more so because this again is a crossover piece and likewise if we were to think about a contemporary diptych which is this little chap at here we can see that this is a two surface it's carrying information it's got two planes it's got a front and a back and the book stops here. I don't know if you can see that, but it is available on my mm -hmm. Facebook page. The book stops here. Yeah. So there you go. I mean, that is that, that for me is as relevant as anything else. So it's like when we see a painting and it's got a book in it. You know, the artist has painted a book. That is a book. It's not a real book. It's a painting of a book, but it is recognizable as a book. Is it a book? Well, yes, it is a book. I mean, OK, we could go down the surrealist route and say this is not a book, but let's, you know, leave that for the time being. Perhaps something that's a little bit more recognizable as a book would be this little chap here. Now, I was talking about clay and using clay. Now, if you want to get texture, physical texture into your work, use clay and this is a mixture of uh, soils clays from uh, Singapore and an air dried modeling clay so you can really feel and see those different textures happening so that's the clay uh, Adeline sent to you yeah so that's what it's about it, it ties in with the work and what I'll do is I'll just stand this book up very carefully because it isn't mine of course it is a customer's. But if we look at the spine of the book, can you see how we've got these multiple raised bands? Yeah. 
okay and it looks like a ceramic pot yeah 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 that's true so so if we look at a ceramic pot that's got a very similar and you'll see where the inspiration comes from this is a ceramic pot and you can see those self same lines there so again when we're talking about inspiration and where do ideas come from they come from everywhere all the time every time you know it's about being open and i suppose if we were to look at another book which is perhaps slightly more traditional that's a very important uh, uh, moment a very important point because uh, uh, for sure there are bookbinders who want to follow the traditions of uh, yes, 17th of 18th century and they are yes, in, in in their own right but then of course are. it's of it's course okay yeah. to to have to take inspiration from anything and it's okay to experiment and uh, of some, course it is unfortunately there are people who who would say no you should follow the tradition but uh, yeah. well in that case i'd like to know do they do they use a horse to go to work every day <laughs> yeah do exactly. they do they do they have diphtheria <laughs> do they have rickets uh you know you've got to draw a line in a parallel somewhere if there wasn't experimentation yeah. and people moving forward yeah. We'd still be living in well, naked, running around, gathering berries. You know, one has to live in today's age for the future. But we have the luxury of being able to pick and choose the past that we want to live in. So this is perhaps a, uh, a more of a, a book that people may recognise in simple materials. I tend not to put labels and things on the spine because the collectors know. Uh, where their, everything is in their collections. And if we were looking at the ceramic book, we can see it has got a label, but there's no text on it. It is just an inlay panel of yeah. the ceramic mixture. And again, on the spine of the box here, we can see we've got this tooled impression. And this is a book, this is full leather. It was uh, not a trolling tool or, or something like that you used to, to, to make this impression or, or what, what? If I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, I actually, I actually haven't published this yet, okay. and I, I used to tell people, and then I'd find an article with their name after it using my technique. So okay. I'm very, I'm, I, I got slightly miffed at that, as you can imagine. But basically, yeah. it's a very simple, it's a traditional way of working, but with a contemporary lilt. And then the end papers are flottage papers. Again, colours match, and everything works. And again, this is working. A collaboration that's something you do a lot with with your works i mean this sort of paper um not a lot i mean i do use it but i do as i do use other forms of paper and it ties in with the life of the mayfly i mean for example in the previous book we were just looking at if i can just close that up put it back the end papers for this particular book and the dublers are well that's not flottage. That's okay. that's something else. And if you look at it, you can see the outline of ceramic vessels. Yeah. And this is actually slip, coloured slip, which I've sealed onto the paper. So it's as if colour is dripped from the pots or is dripping onto the pots. And the and again, texture I'm... is also reminding of, of uh, handmade pots or something like that. So exactly, yeah, it is about ceramics. And again. Um, you know, when we're looking at the Dublur, I don't know if you can see, but can you see we've got a texture of tooling on there? Maybe you so can you can you can move the camera a bit away. Yeah, that's much better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we can see that shape there. That's a traditional wheel that I've just impressed into the wet clay. Yeah. Which is what the ceramic artist did in a you but using different tools. And again, you know, the ceramic artist he labels and titles his work by pressing letter forms into wet clay. So I've done that. I'm echoing, I've drawn inspiration from what's on the inside, but I've reinterpreted it in my own way. It's not a, it's not a copy, it's not a follow through. It's a reinterpretation. It's a different way of looking at it, but with similar material manipulation. So yeah, I've got no problem. Um, yeah. yeah. And this multitude of, uh, of raised bands is, is sort of, eat it from you to all these people who are making five rice bands or something. <laughs> I never said that. I never said that. I never said that. Um, but again, we can take it another stage. I mean, you know, books don't have to be huge, big and everything else. So I just a minor accident there. Um, in that with smaller books, you can actually have a more of a sculptural context. So again, we're looking at different material manipulation and the book is a fixed backboard binding. 
So the backboard extends over. To, and this is a book about basically uh, dark ages, sailing ships, death on the high sea, pageantry, kings and queens and all that sort of thing. So basically what I've done is I've created a book that's got a sails on it. So it looks like an old fashioned sailing ship. And then we've got these tesserae, which hark back to the pageantry and the flags of a medieval age. And that's just done using a cold gold technique, something similar to what Klimt would have used. So, but again, it's drawing inspiration, not just from other bookbinders, but from people that use the medium gold and using it in a different way to, to create something completely different with it. Again, you know, there's a little bit of traditional sort of edge decoration there sort of thing, contemporary gophering, if you like. But again, it's not just slavishly do doing what's before because that's the only way there is and that's how I was taught to do it and that's all I'm going to do. Um, you know, there's got to be, for me, there's got to be more into it. Um, do you want to look at one more? Yeah, sure. And by the way, that's one of the books you showcased during your uh, summer virtual exhibition. So if anyone wants to see a bit more and hear by a bit more about this book, they can go to your Facebook uh, page and look for it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It was a stunning exhibition full of glitches. <laughs> Absolutely. So, but now perhaps we're going to be looking at a book here, which is uh, one of my personal favorites. This is um, it's a big book, as we can see from the size of the box, two tray drop back box. And this for me, um, sort of in a way, uh, exemplifies one of the philosophies I have about the book. Number one, the boxes have got to be well made, obviously, but this is, and he tries to open it, and it's got us, there we go, that's better. So this is a book and it's, a, it's called Shadow Day and Eternity. And it's the work of one of my favorite artists. And this is sort of a homage if you like. Um, sorry, I've just pressed a button and I don't know what I'm doing. It's all right, don't worry. And um, it's um, about the work of Joseph Cornell. And I just love the work of Joseph Cornell. I mean, he does it for me every time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just put this on the bench, if I may. So everything's going to go a bit squiffy for a while, okay? Yeah. It's a big book. <laughs> it's a very big book. And I wish I had a tripod and everything. But anyway, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the work of Joseph Cornell, um, he is very often cited as the artist's artist. Um, his work is uh, sublime, it is beautiful. He helped organize the first surrealist exhibition in America. A very influential and extraordinarily gifted person. Never traveled outside of his own location, but he traveled the world with his work. And what I've done is I've created the work of Cornell. Now, in a lot of Cornell's work, not a lot, but some of his box art, he uses sand. And I don't know if you can see, but I've got sand in the cover as well we can see that oh yeah, line yeah. working there yeah absolutely <laughs> okay so what this does it sort of echoes what's happening this will take a few minutes to sort of decant from one area to the other so this is what i mean about books working both upside down and the right way the only way to actually get this to work is to turn the book upside down and we can see how this is sort of going out of here. Yeah, so you are making the, the user of the book to break the rules as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To engage with it, you've got to work with it. So that's, that's that one there. And I've got a beautiful reflection of myself just now. And so that's doing that. Now, if I turn it the right way up or a perceived right way up, we can see how the top sand will start to disappear. And this really does give a a beautiful sense of movement and it really is something else and i hope this is all in focus i'm doing this freehand of course yeah we but can see anyway, that it moves yeah oh yeah but it's the light catching the particles and then as the sand slowly disappears and it is doing its stuff you see this beautiful shape appearing and then this eye that looks back at us reappearing oh that's very poetic it's beautiful isn't it Look at that. <laughs> I love it. Fun. 
Yeah, it's great. I know. I love it. I love it. I just one of these things. So that's that. But when we go into it, and of course, you know, it's got sewn M bands. It's got a little bit of edge decoration. But we can see this brie collage work as well, because again, that's what Cornell worked in. He was a self-taught artist by and large. He did attend the evening classes and stuff, but he was self-taught. So this is echoing his sort of working style. And if we go into the book, again, we get this follow through with colors, with various different elements happening. So that when we open it, we end up with the work very similar, but in, similar, inspired by what he did. So a Turner day means, you know, everything is going into eternity. But again, we're looking at this in reverse. The foreground is actually smaller than the background. We can see how that collage works there. And then we've got the profile of Cornell in shadow. So that's that one there. Now the backboard, I have to say, is my favourite um, because I, I play with this quite often, though it is available, of course. This is um, a backboard and it's basically a thing of sand and you can actually move the sand. Oh, wow. So that every time you open the book, you form a new and completely different book in itself. So it's a different book every time. And then when we go into the uh, back to blur pages, we can see that continuation happening, asymmetry within the end papers. And that's Shadow Day and Eternity, Joseph Cornell. So again, it's about taking inspiration. It's about looking at the work and not, I mean, if I were to put that book in a full leather binding with a bit of gold tooling and five raised bands, it would be wrong it would be completely wrong. So by treating it as a contemporary work, by physically looking at it, touching it, feeling it, and it being inspired by the work that's in the text block, then what you have, of course, is you have the holistic approach to bookbinding and book arts. Is this book art? Well, I suppose it is. And of course, the original book came with a DVD, whatever it is. So that's in there as well. So again, you know, that's a manipulation of materials and manipulation of an art or way of working with art and design. And we can just see that the box closes down like that. I like boxes. Um, <laughs> and, and that sort of thing. So that's, that's basically it. Um, would you like to look at one more? <laughs> yeah, but uh, let me just say that this was amazing. Guzam could spare if I ever saw one. This was mesmerizing. Wow. That's, that's, Thank that's, you. That's just no problem, no problem. Um, if we think of what we've just looked at, and we think of that moving sand, and then you think about concrete poetry. Now, concrete poetry is a number of different things to a number of people, but it is the possibilities of the letter and the word forming and reforming to create a new visual text. Now, the visual text does not have to be in type. It can be in anything. So what... What is the step? What is the next logical thing to do? Well, perhaps to create a book or book object which works with that. So this is a book we can see. It's a, trip, it's a diptych, it's got two surfaces, it opens, but within the text block, the single page, if you like, we have sand. So again, what I'm exploring is how the sand keeps shaping and reforming and if we were to look at those in an abstract way as lines of type of words of letters again every time we use pick this up we have a different vista a different way of looking at this single page and all of a sudden it becomes not a static thing but it becomes a kinetic book a kinetic text which is able to you know revolve and evolve around the person who's using it understanding it and engaging with it so that's a simple form so that's a combination of box making of book binding book arts and again about understanding how books and art can work together and that there is a synergy within the form and the function of the book so i'll just put that to one side that's good that's, uh, yeah okay right fine exotic tours um in today's age, it's the cult of the selfie. And for me, the box also becomes an extension. And again, this is on, on the Facebook summer exhibition. Uh, the box becomes an extension 
of the binding itself. It's rather like the frame for a painting, if you like. It's the, the theatre curtain. Just as the play or the orchestra strikes up, that curtain opens. The safety curtain opens and we get into those lush things. We get this idea of what's happening. And then we can open the box up. And again, my box making. There we go. And we open this up into exotic tours. Now, when I've travelled abroad, I see many groups of people going around exhibitions, going around cultural buildings, architecture. And what they're doing is they're not looking at the architecture, they're looking at themselves in front of the architecture through the camera, through the selfie. It's the cult of the selfie. So we can see that with this, again, this binding is a full cloth binding. That's animal friendly to our vegan friends. Um, again, this is hand painted, hand sprayed. We can see that again, it's this 360 degree view. And you'll see that all the images and things, they have overlays, collage work that's been put over them. You can basically see that where it is the cult of the selfie. So we have some quite well-known works of art and lost art in this as well where we start exploring sort of the tour where, again, we're looking at how we don't look at the work, we look at ourselves first, or well, themselves first, and the exhibition or the tour <clears throat> becomes something that is forgotten. It's not important. It's about how we see ourselves within that environment. So again, we go through this, and again, we've got, you know, crude, popularism, all sorts of text that revolves around it, the myth. And again, you know, you've got icons in art and design, culture, history, the environment, and it's all sort of lost to the cult of the selfie. Every time I go to, to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, it uh, amazes me how, how many people are making say, uh, selfies in front of the uh, Nightwatch uh, or other yeah. uh, famous paintings. and. Uh, uh, my question always is not, not not the mouth question, just just something I, I speak to myself. Uh, why would you do that? Because uh, uh, you can you can have a digital copy of the painting on the web. You can yeah. have a pictures of you anywhere else. What you can buy what, a tea what, town. What yeah. what gives what what this photo what this selfie gives to you and uh, what it brings well, what to it, what it is. It, what I believe it is, it's a self-imposed form of gosh, aren't I educated? Look where I am. You can tell where I am because, you know, you can see where uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm in front of. And look at this wonderful piece of art, but I'm more important. It's a very selfish, selfish, selfish attitude, I think. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, again, it's about education and people's expectations and how they feel that they should see the world. But less about that. That's more of a philosophical thing. Um, so this is uh, surviving material, and this is a uh, hand-decorated book cloth. Again, it's not just leather that we can bind and decorate. We can actually use book cloths, and we can use all sorts of things in our material. So again, this is about material manipulation, and it's also about seeing you know, different things in different ways and being able to manipulate all those materials. And again, this is a drum leaf binding, and again, this is using silt screens, stencil work, hand painting, collage work again. And this is basically about surviving. It is about looking at how images, when you start to distort them, what is seen and what disappears, what survives in the eye and how we can, you know, um, work with a selection of titles, if you like, that uh, keep uh, a sort of um, modernist, perhaps figurative way of working within a very simple format of what material survives. And this again, is also this is also a psychological experiment because uh, our brains are hardwired to find some patterns and. Uh... Yeah, exactly. You think there should, there is a narrative. There's an obvious narrative, and the narrative is created with the imagery and also the way that the uh, color is being applied and that sort of thing. But what it is is you can actually physically see. As the <clears throat> silk screen is used, the image degrades and you start to lose detail within that uncleaned um, sort of uh, silk screen. And again, it's about you know, what we see, what survives and, and what we mentally put in its place to create the completed image. So again, it's, it's 
basically it's asking you know, question, questions, all sorts of things, you know, why? Why, what is survives? Why does it survive? So again, there is, there's always more than one um, way of looking at work. So yes, I work within the contemporary traditional way of working, I suppose. And I work within book sculptures, book art, uh, printing, all sorts of things. It, again, it's about a, a very much of a, a holistic approach to the work and to how we can perhaps engage and see different things. And again, you know, my inspiration comes from all sorts of things. Cornell, uh, you know, Peter Blake, the list goes on and on and on. Mel Gooding. Uh, Rothenstein, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, it's also about, you know, looking at the traditional aspect of the book as well. I don't, I don't just, you know, sort of go, all right, modern, modern, modern. Some of my favorite books are, you know, relatively old. They're relatively, yeah, they're only two, 300 years old sort of thing. So I do look at those and I do gain continued joy and satisfaction at being able to look and share in that sort of, uh, style of work, the antiquity of it, the beauty of it, the essence of what the creators were doing and what they achieved and how I can continue to share in that. What do you think about the work of Grayson Perry? Because I uh, look at what in inspires you and, uh, you and him uh, seem to have a very similar set of heroes. Um, I think that what uh, Grayson does it's uh, he's kick-started ceramics in the UK that's for sure um, but um, he's um, he's very media savvy and he uses the media so this is a book about bookworms I just sort of so bookworms so it's got holes in it and this is <laughs> and this is for any conservator out there they're now going oh my god but this is bookworms I have something to show you I guess uh, just, just just a moment <laughs> Here is the book I, I bought in, in Bucharest uh, Beautiful. Uh, uh, some time ago. And uh, uh, I didn't need the book, of course, but I wanted to buy it just because it's so it's amazing. And, uh, it, and you, it's, it's yeah. full of holes and yeah. <laughs> you can see it here Absolutely as well. Super. So, um, so, how many, so you bought that? Yeah. yeah so, um, these are for sale. Uh, if you want to buy, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I think that it, it's Grayson Perry is very interesting guy, very media savvy. He has kickstarted ceramics and applied arts within the UK, that's for sure. And it's it's very easy. He's very he's very easy. With he's, he's been doing um, art and craft with Grayson Perry during lockdown, uh, yeah. which has been apparent. I haven't watched it, but apparently it was it was well received by people who make arts and craft toilet roll covers and stuff like that but i think that his his approach is again a very holistic approach i mean he's the first person that will say you know he doesn't really have any training uh, you know his ceramics training was done in an evening class and you know he shows quite happy to talk about his earlier work and he will you know he's a very enthusiastic and yes he does gain his inspiration from all manner of things from antiquity to the contemporary and he uses them and he also uses contemporary production methods contemporary ways of working to and also to um sort of you know, make his work for now you know he's not trying to copy an, a ming vase he's doing what he's doing now and i think that's very 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 important because a copy will always be a copy an original is always an original. Oh, that was a good note to finish on, wasn't it? <laughs> God, I've, I've, got to, I've got to remember that. <laughs> I also wanted to, to show you that uh, this book I, I bought in Bucharest uh, struck a note because of uh, its uh, topic and title. So it's about uh, uh, Nicholas the First, uh, Russian em emperor. <laughs> so, so it was uh, twice as good for me because of the warmth and because of the uh, Russian Fantastic. emperor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing how you do get that essence of things just being right and being perfect. But yeah, again, exactly. you know, you know, from the conservatives' perspective, there we go. Oh, it's got to be. We're going to look after this. We've got to do that. But it's beautiful and it has resonance in its own right as it is. Why change it? 
Yeah. You know, why change it? There is no. Yeah. There's no need to change it. 